This is a 2002 Aston Martin DB7 V12 Vantage Volante. <laughs> That's a lot of words, but the gist is it's a V12-powered Aston Martin you can get for a bargain price. And today I'm going to review this DB7 and show you around a modern Aston with a V12 and a manual transmission and a surprisingly affordable price tag. <laughs> To start, this car is currently being auctioned on Cars and Bids, which is my new online enthusiast car auction website. This car is currently live. The auction just started today, and it will run for the next seven days. So if you're looking for a DB7 or an exotic car you can buy with a relatively affordable price tag, this might be the car for you. Watch my review and then head over to Cars and Bids. I will link this this auction in the description below so you can bid on this DB7. So let's talk DB7. This car was originally developed as a Jaguar, but Ford shelved the project when they took over Jaguar in the early 1990s. Aston Martin picked it up, but money was tight, so they did it on a budget and they borrowed taillights from a Mazda and interior switches from a Ford and mirrors from a Citroën. The result was the DB7, which debuted in 1994. It came with a supercharged six-cylinder engine and you could get it in coupe or convertible form. But the six-cylinder never really gave the DB7 the performance and power that it needed with only 335 horsepower. So a few years later, Aston replaced the six-cylinder with the engine in this car, a V12, 420 horsepower, 400 pound-feet of torque. They called it the DB7 V12 Vantage. And like the six cylinder, you could get it with an automatic or a manual transmission. This one has the manual, which is pretty cool. It's not too often you get to row your own gears in a naturally aspirated V12. But today, I'm going to do just that. Well, first, I'm going to take you on a thorough tour of the DB7, and I'm going to show you all of the quirks and features of Aston Martin's most popular model from the 1990s and early 2000s. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the DB7 by getting in, and that means I must use the key, which is a Jaguar key with an Aston Martin logo on the end of it. They just borrowed it right from Jaguar. Then you go to open the door and you pull the door handle, which is a Mazda 323 door handle. They just borrowed that from the Mazda 323 and they stuck it on this car. Like I said, budgets were tight when this was developed and they borrowed parts wherever they possibly could. And since we're in this vicinity and talking borrowed parts, we gotta talk mirrors. Now the mirrors on these later DB7s, I'm not sure if they were borrowed from a car. They may have been Aston Martin's own design, but the early DB7 models use the mirrors from the Citroen CX. Now you might be thinking that's a little strange. How does Aston Martin have any allegiance or tie to Citroën? Well, it turns out the DB7 wasn't the only vehicle to use these mirrors. They were also on the Jaguar XJ220, the Lotus Esprit, and the McLaren F1, and the early Aston Martin DB7s all borrowed their mirrors from the Citroën CX. So it wasn't only Aston that was borrowing components from other automakers. Further proof of that comes when you open the door, climb inside, and you see the mirror switch, which is just used in Ford models from the early 2000s. This was the same switch in the Focus, the Taurus, basically all Fords. But before you go judging Aston Martin too much for this, this is the exact same mirror switch that's in my Ford GT. So you could look at it as a glass is half empty kind of person. This is a Ford Focus mirror switch, or you could say the DB7 used the same mirror switch from the Ford GT. And next we move into the DB7. But before we do, I want to start here because there's some interesting things to cover in this area. For one thing, this interior color. You have this dark blue with cream or gray seats. I really like how this looks. It has kind of a yacht theme to it, and it looks good, especially with that wood in here. This interior is also really nicely kept. The seats, everything is in pretty good shape, especially for a DB7. These got pretty cheap, and a lot of them were used and abused. This was a one-owner car its whole life, so that never really happened to it, and it was kept pretty nice and in a pretty desirable and unique interior color. With that said, some rather 
unusual, we'll call them, items in the door sill area. For one, you have a plaque here that says DB7 Vantage. Looks very beautiful, except that it's screwed in with four exposed Phillips screws. <laughs> so you just unscrew that if you want. They didn't go to any trouble to hide <laughs> the stuff that keeps that in place. You also have the parking brake here, which is a little unusual in its operation. Right now, even though it's down, it is actually on. In order to pull the parking brake on, you lift it up, and then it goes on, and then you can push it down so that it's out of your way if you want to climb in or out of the car. When you want to release the parking brake, you pull it back up, push the button in, and then push it down like a normal parking brake that releases it, and then you're ready to go. Now, I mentioned the parking brake here because it is integral to the next thing I want to talk about, and that would be the convertible top process, which is rather quirky. Now, to start the convertible top going up or down, you have to have the parking brake on. It won't move unless the brake is on. Once you've done that, then you see these little grab handles in the interior? Well, those aren't grab handles at all. Instead, they're top latches. The back part is actually a button. You push it and then pull the latch down and that unlatches the latch. You do that on the other side and now the top is unlatched. Not grab handles or coat hook handles, but actually hidden top latches. Anyway, after you've done that with the parking brake on, you then press this little button in the center console. You can see with the top on it and some arrows. You push that and then take a look. Now, with the top down or folded back, you can see it sticks up quite a bit for a top that is down. That was just a reality of the DB7. Fortunately, you were able to cover it if you wanted to. They gave you this leather top boot that you could put over it, and that would make it look better. But it didn't really hide the fact that it did stick up quite a bit when you had the top down. That was just sort of something you lived with. Now, as you might expect, if you want to put the top back up, it's pretty much the same process in reverse. First, you put on the parking brake, and then you press the top button, and then, well, it goes up, as you can see. And once the top basically meets the windshield, you re-latch it using those secret coat hanger looking things that aren't actually coat hangers, and then it's back in place and you can drive around with the top up. And that's the operation in the DB7. But anyway, climb into this car and you are greeted by a lot of stuff from other vehicles once again. For instance, the turn signal stock comes straight out of a Ford from this era. Same deal with the windshield wiper stock, again, straight out of a Ford from this era. And Aston Martin used this wiper and signal stock for years, well beyond on the DB7, even after Ford didn't even own them anymore. Same deal with the window switches. These are Ford window switches from this era. They weren't on all Ford models, but they were on some, and they were on the DB7 as well. And the stereo, even though the head unit says Aston Martin on it, this was just a Becker stereo that went into a lot of cars from this era, specifically exotic cars. It was in every Ferrari 360 and 550. This was the stereo unit they all had. Now, the funny thing is, because the stereo and the car were weren't designed together, they both have a flashing light letting you know that your alarm system is armed. And for some reason, Aston put their flashing light right next to the stereo's flashing light, and they flash at different intervals. So you have the stereo light flashing, and then you have the car alarm light flashing, and they're both sort of randomly flashing to let you know the alarm is on, because again, they were developed separately. The car's light separate from the radio's light. They are redundant but it has two flashing lights as a result. Next up, since we're in this vicinity, something that wasn't shared with other vehicles, this transmission. This is a pretty impressive spec car because it is a V12 convertible with a manual. As you might expect, most of the V12 convertibles were automatic. It's pretty uncommon that you find one with a six-speed manual like this car has. Now, interestingly, in the early DB7 models with the six-cylinder engine, the automatic transmission was from General Motors. It was the GM 4L80 that was used in many, many, many vehicles, including in this one, another borrowed part. And still speaking of borrowed items in this car, the chassis. This car basically rides on a Jaguar XJS chassis that was just modified and updated a little bit to fit with the DB7. Like I said, this started life being developed as a Jaguar and switched to an Aston Martin later, and that's why. But it is yet another borrowed piece in this car's development. 
And next up, some other interesting quirks and features in this interior. This car comes from the era where starter buttons were cool, but they didn't quite have the technology developed enough yet. You still had to insert the key first and then press the engine start button. This was true of a lot of early 2000s exotic cars and sports cars, the Honda S2000, my Ford GT. You got to get in, turn the key, then press the bright red engine start button. It kind of just adds drama to the whole experience. Next up, another interesting quirk is the climate vents, and specifically the ones on the sides of this interior. They're mounted on the doors, which is an unusual placement, but the strangest part is there are three settings for them. You can turn them on or off, or the third setting is defogger, and it will channel the air up through this vent and defog your side windows. Kind of strange to see that control right at the position of the vent. And next up, here's another interesting placement. This car was made without a glove box, which is odd because it appears there is space there for a glove box, but they must have had something behind it, they didn't make one. So instead, your only storage is the center console. You can see this lid opens up, and that's your storage in there. It doesn't lock, so it's not quite as useful as a glove box, but it is storage nonetheless. Now, if you wanted, you could opt for cup holders in this car, and the owner of this one did just that. You push this little button, the cup holders pop out, and then they pretty much block access to the manual transmission. You can't really have a drink in them and still shift gears. It was kind of an afterthought, clearly, but they're there in case you have an emergency and you need somewhere to place a cup. Next up, another rather unusual one in here is the dome light switch. The dome lights have three different positions. You have on or off or 12 seconds. <laughs> Never seen that option in a dome light before. I guess if you switch to that, the light will stay on for 12 seconds after you shut the door so you have a little light to gather your stuff or leave the car after you've parked it at your house so it's not completely dark. But it is strange to see that on the dome light, a setting for 12 seconds. And next up, another rather unusual control. In the climate controls, over on the right, you have this one that's a dial, and then there's a man with an arrow pointing to his head. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that does, but I think think it directs the airflow. If you have it all the way on the top, then the air goes up to the windshield. If you have it all the way on the bottom, the air goes to your feet, and in the middle it goes to your head, and that's why the man is there with the arrow pointing to him. But it is not a very descriptive dial, if that really is what it's supposed to do. But anyway, another unusual quirk in this interior is the sheer number of Aston Martin logos staring at you if you're sitting in these seats. For instance, you have one on the clock. You can see the wings. Right above that, you have one between the two center air vents. You have one in the middle of the steering wheel, and you have one in the speedometer, of course, and also another one in the tachometer. And if that wasn't enough, you have one on the driver's side floor mat, and then another one over on the passenger side floor mat, and then there's an Aston Martin logo on all three pedals. The clutch, the brake, the accelerator, Aston Martin, Aston Martin, Aston Martin. You also have it in the seats, an Aston Martin logo imprinted onto the seat backs. It's almost Almost like they're trying to say, no, no, we know there are a lot of parts from other cars all over this interior, but don't get confused. It really is an Aston Martin, we swear. They're making up for all their part sharing by overcompensating with Aston Martin logos in here. Next, we move on to the DB7's back seats. Yes, this car has back seats, although I have no idea why. They are laughably small. As you can see, there is basically no room back here, but Nonetheless, I will now do my usual attempt to climb into them. This front seat is all the way forward already. I move the seat back forward, and then, only because it's a convertible, I can get in here. I sit down, and I don't have enough room for my waist, or my knees, or my legs. And because the convertible top is behind these seats, the backrest is straight up. So even if I had room for all that stuff, it still wouldn't be a comfortable seating position. This is one of the tiniest, most ridiculous back seats I have ever seen in any vehicle. And yet, here I am in them. Now, one item worth noting in the back window, you can see it's sticking up a little bit. This is as far down as it goes, strangely enough. And it operates with the roof. So when the roof is down, the back window is down. When the roof is up, the back window goes up automatically. There's no button or switch you can use to control the windows yourself. It just goes with whatever the roof does. And next we move around back in the DB7. I want to go into the trunk. Now, one way you can do that is with the key fob, which, by the way, is hilarious. Just like so many other things in this 
car. The FOB is not some specially designed Aston Martin piece. Instead, it looks like this generic key fob that you'd get from an aftermarket car stereo installer who just stuck an alarm system in your car. But this is what Aston Martin used in this vehicle from the factory. You press the little trunk button on there with a generic car with its trunk open and then it pops open and now I can open it up. There is another way to open the trunk that is way cooler though. You come up to the back, there's no keyhole back here until you flip up the Aston Martin logo in back. It reveals the keyhole, you stick the key in and you can open the trunk from there. But either way, we open up the trunk and we quickly discover there are some interesting quirks worth mentioning in here. Like for example, the load floor isn't flat. <laughs> Not even close, really. What's the reason for that? You pull up the floor and it turns out the spare tire is mounted in here, but sideways, not flat. And that is what's contributing to the trunk floor having this giant hump in it. As if that wasn't weird enough, you have a little box in the trunk with a little latch. You open that and there's storage capacity in here for like a book, maybe. Not the owner's manual, it doesn't actually fit in here, but something else, something small you could stick in there if you wanted to really hide it, except it would be obvious to anyone who opens your trunk. It's not a great hiding place. Next up, a few other trunk items worth noting. It is surprisingly quirky back here. Over on the side of the trunk, you have a leather bag. That is a first aid kit, a leather first aid kit. Aston Martin even classing up the first aid kit, apparently kind of strange. Next up, another quirk back here. You can see this audio equipment mounted in the back that says Aston Martin Premium Audio. Of course, as we actually know, the sound system is made by Becker and was used in many other vehicles. Again, it also said Aston Martin on the head unit. They really want you to think it's Aston Martin, except when you turn it on, it says Becker. <laughs> So all of that Aston Martin branded stuff goes out the window the moment you actually try to use the sound system. Nonetheless, I'm sure it was a very premium sound experience. One other item you have back here on the inside of the trunk lid, the umbrella. Aston Martins come with an umbrella since they are from rainy England. And so this one has its umbrella. It appears to have never really been used. So you could be the first to get rained on your Aston Martin umbrella. But by far my favorite item in the trunk is undoubtedly the owner's manual, which is this little book. Nothing too unusual about it. A lot of British car owner's manuals look like this at the time. The strange thing is on an early page, there's a spot where the selling dealership would write in your VIN. <laughs> And you can see the VIN doesn't actually go to the end of the boxes they have for it. Even though all VINs were 17 digits by global automaker agreement 20 years before this car was made, in the owner's manual they left 19 boxes for the VIN, just in case it ever grows. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but that kind of speaks to Aston Martin in the early 2000s. But anyway, next up, I want to move on from the trunk, but stay around the back because I want to talk taillights. These are from a Mazda 323F, which is this kind of weird looking hatchback. You can see the exact same taillight there, minus that center light bar is in this car. Although here it has kind of a housing around it, but it's the same. Back here also, you have the fuel door mounted horizontally on the rear fender. That's straight out of a Jaguar, same operation, same door. Although you open it up and you do have a beautiful Aston Martin fuel cap. Again, Aston never misses an opportunity to remind you what you're driving. Next up, two big benefits with this car worth mentioning. One is the exhaust note. This sounds shockingly good for a car from this era. A lot of exhausts were muted at the time. Not this one. Take a listen. <laughs> But the exhaust note isn't the only thing I love out here. Frankly, I love the exterior styling of this car. I've always felt the DB7 was absolutely beautiful. And I think this car kind of got robbed because when it came out and it was very successful for Aston Martin, Ford realized they should never have gotten rid of the design and they hastily scrambled to get the Jaguar XK8 to the market with a similar look. And that car and this car always looked very similar, but it was Aston who had it first, who believed in this design and who came up with it. And I I think this has always been a beautiful car and I think it's aging very well. It's a subtle, simple design, no weird gouges, not too representative of a certain time period. It looks great, especially when you combine it with a V12, a convertible, a manual, and the Aston Martin badge, especially at this price point. And next up, we move on to the front of the DB7 and specifically, I'm going to get under the hood. I'm going to unlatch it and open up the hood and you can see the glorious V12. That 
that was a big deal in this car, replacing a supercharged six cylinder with a V12. And it was a big power boost too. Like I said, 420 horsepower, 400 pound feet of torque, pretty healthy numbers, especially compared to the old Super 6, which only had about 330 horsepower. When this engine went in, it was a really big deal. And depending on the transmission you selected, it improved your zero to 60 time by one to two seconds, which is a pretty substantial amount. Anyway, a few notable items under the hood. One, just like in modern Aston Martin models, there is a little plaque letting you know who did the final inspection at the Aston Martin factory. It mentions the factory worker by name. This was 20 years ago. This person's probably not still there, but maybe they will watch this video with fond memories. You also have a plaque under the hood that is gold, which I assumed would be some sort of special edition or some commemorative thing. Actually, it just lists the car's weight distribution, front and rear, and shows the VIN. <laughs> so I'm not sure why they made that gold, like it was going to be special, but it isn't. But it does have the Aston Martin logo on it, and so does this label under the hood, and so does this label under the hood. And of course, the engine says Aston Martin V12 on the side of it. They really wanted you to know it was an Aston everywhere you looked. They even put the Aston logo on the side of the car next to the rear seats behind the rear window on both sides, a very unorthodox place for a manufacturer logo, but it's there. Now, by modern standards, this may seem like desperation, all these logos, but you got to remember, in the 90s, Aston had gone through a serious slump, their future was uncertain, and then this car came out and it was a huge success. And Aston wanted to announce to the world, hey, we're back, this is what we're making now, and that's why they did all of the logos everywhere. A lot of people at this point had never seen an Aston Martin, they were really rare. This one made the brand a lot more accepted and widely known. And so those are the quirks and features of the Aston Martin DB7 V12 Vantage Volante. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the DB7 V12. This car has a few really big things going for it. Even though I kind of make fun of it for all the switch gear that's borrowed and all the panels and pieces that are borrowed, and you might think it feels like a bit of a kit car, but that's one of the things it has going for it. It doesn't. It actually drives exceptionally well. And I've driven DB7s before, and I have to say, this is one of the better driving examples. Like I said, it's a one owner car, it's got 13,000 miles, 14. I mean, this is a really, really clean example. And late production car, well kept clearly. Uh, it drives tight. It's surprising. And honestly, to me, it feels quicker than I expected it to. 420 horsepower, not that strong of a number, but it's responsive. You step on it and it builds power quickly. It is a fast and exciting car. And to me, that really is one of the big selling points here. The simple fact that it drives like a cool car. Now, another big benefit here is it's an Aston Martin and frankly, not a very expensive Aston Martin. You can get a V12 powered manual transmission Aston for a reasonable amount of money. So those are two big pluses. And to me, the other big plus is the styling. I've always felt this was a beautiful car. Like I said, I really think it got robbed when the Jaguar XK8 came out, which was intended to be sort of a clone of this, just a down market version. And it made this car's styling always feel less special. But I think if there had never been an XK8, we would look back on the DB7 as a pretty nice looking car. Now, like I mentioned in the video, pretty rare to find a manual transmission uh, convertible version of this car. Most of the convertibles were automatics. In fact, a lot of DB7s in general were automatics because Aston always had that reputation of being sort of a more luxury focused, grand touring focused brand. That's why they included these large rear seats for a nice grand tour. Speaking of another kind of funny aspect about this car's grand touring capabilities, it does not have cruise control, believe it or not. Um, this is a 2002 car that cost like 150 grand then no cruise control. Maybe Aston Martin couldn't find another automaker who would make it for him. All right, on the highway here, getting up to speed, it just, it just drives really well. It feels, I'm very confident in the powertrain, uh, taking it high in the rev range. I don't really feel worried that it's gonna break or be damaged. You know, I think one of the big secrets of modern Aston Martins is they're more reliable than we all think. I know a lot of people who have V8 Vantages, and I had one, and it was, Pretty, I mean, aside from some hiccups early on, it was dead reliable. I think we're in an interesting period in Aston Martin where the cars have gotten cheap, but reliability is caught up to a modern, more modern standard. And now you can drive one of these. Here's a V12 stick shift car for Toyota Camry money. 
and maybe it isn't so bad. This one certainly feels well done, well screwed together. Overall, this is certainly an interesting car. It was an interesting time for Aston Martin. They were, even today, they're kind of known as being in shaky financial ground, pretty much in perpetuity. But back then it was even worse. And there was a lot of questions as to whether the brand would even survive. And a car like the DB7, where other people had done a lot of the development, where other people supplied a lot of the parts and the switches and everything, it was kind of the only way they could make it work. And they did, and they brought Aston Martin to a wider audience, a more modern car. And this car did really well. And driving it now with the V12, this is a later production model, you can see why it kind of stayed around for so long. There are some obvious flaws, but I think that's represented in the price. And I think at this price point for a V12 manual convertible Aston Martin with this kind of mileage, I don't know. I think it's a pretty good buy, um, especially compared to other stuff you can get at this number. And so that's the DB7 V12 Vantage Volante. This was an important car for Aston Martin. It brought them into the modern era and it got them past a period of financial difficulty and struggles and slow sales. This is probably the best version of this car with the convertible top and the V12 and the manual transmission. And you can bid on it right now on Cars and Bids with the link in the description below. Anyway, now it is time to give the DB7 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the DB7 is a nice looking car, a bit dated, a bit not special enough, but generally attractive, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Handling is acceptably sharp, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Fun factor is nice, rowing your own gears in a V12 with the top down, it's all pretty enjoyable, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and these are indeed pretty cool, a V12 Aston with Aston badges everywhere to let people know what you have, it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 32 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This car has what you'd expect for equipment, but not much else, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is nice, although the driving position is a bit compromised because the seat doesn't adjust down. It's not broken, that just wasn't one of the adjustments Aston gave you, so long-legged people might get a bit cramped. Still, the ride quality is good for a sports car, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is okay, the interior is nice enough, but materials aren't amazing, and reliability is a question mark, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is fine, most four-seat cars get a 4, but those backseat are just so small, I have to give it a 3 out of 10. Finally, value, and these offer handsome styling, V12 power, a convertible top, a manual transmission, all for around 30 grand. It really is a bargain if it stays reliable, and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Added up, and the Doug score is 56 out of 100, which places it here against other luxury sports cars from this era. The DB7 is competitive against rivals like the BMW 850 CSI and the 996 Porsche 911, and the DB7 beats out the Mercedes SL and the Maserati Coupe. Overall, this Aston offers a fun driving experience, attractive styling, and V12 power at a reasonable price. But no, really, it's an Aston Martin, we swear. <laughs> what the hell? What is that? <laughs> I'm just sitting in front of train tracks in a pickup truck. <laughs> How did that occur? <laughs> Okay, anyway.